This is the third of our three segments on what I call linear stuff. That is singular value decomposition, principal component analysis, and anything with the word eigen in front of it. So far, we've learned how to decompose our data matrix X into uh, a singular value decomposition, a sum of rank one matrices, uh, with coefficients s sub i, the singular values, and we're viewing this sum as being going from the largest singular values down to the smallest ones, so it's the early terms in the sum that most matter in the data. What we've also done is we've taken each data point and projected it into the singular vectors to get its principal components. They are, in other words, the coordinates of that data point in the coordinate system where the first axis is the largest singular value, the second axis is along the second largest singular value, or I should say singular vector corresponding to those singular values, and so on. But what we haven't done is actually looked at what the columns of u and v look like. That would be the directions in space of these singular vectors. So let's do that for our data set, which was the gene expression data in yeast. We have 500 genes in this set. And here I'm showing you the amplitudes along these 500 genes of the first in blue, second in red, and third in green columns of the U matrix. And similarly, I can show you the first, second, and third columns of the V matrix. Well, the V matrix do doesn't goes from 0 to 300. It's a 300-dimensional component because these are basis vectors in the space of experiments, and there were 300 of them. These are basis vectors in the space of genes, and there are 500 of them. So sometimes a little bit fancifully, people call these functions on the left eigengenes. That is to say, they are the linear combination of genes that explain the most data. And on this side, because it's an array expression experiment, we can call them eigenarrays. And they are the linear combination of experiments that best explain the most data. And what the singular value decomposition is, of course, is it says you take the first eigengene, you multiply it by the first singular value, um, you multiply it again to make a rank 1 matrix by the first eigenarray, and that's the best you can do at explaining the data with only a single singular vector. Similarly, you then add in the second, third, and fourth. Now, except in special cases, the eigengenes and eigenarrays are not easily interpreted, and that's the downside of this kind of analysis. First of all, there's no particular meaning in the shapes of these graphs, because we could permute the order of experiments and or the order of genes in the data, and so the, the shape would change around. I'm just showing you some particular ordering of genes and experiments to make this a little bit more tangible. Also, as we discussed in the previous segment, the main effects generally don't correspond one to one with eigen anythings. We can hope, at best, that somewhere in the first k eigen thingies, in this case eigen genes and eigen arrays, are lurking the top k main effects. And in that case, this will be a useful dimensional reduction. But let's see whether that is a reasonable expectation. I'm going to construct a toy gene example here that has exactly two main effects, and everything else will be just noise. And we'll see how this shows up in the eigengenes and eigenarrays. So here's our toy model. Our toy model is that first we take uh, 500 genes by 300 experiments, and we put independent 
normal deviates into each of those cells. So there's not anything of interest in that. But now I'm going to create two main effects. I'm going to take gene numbers between 100 and 200 and I'm going to slightly overexpress the experiments, the array cells from 50 to 100 for those and that shows up as a brighter red color here. And then I'm going to create a second in my mind unrelated main effect that takes genes number 300 to 400 and under expresses experiment numbers 200 to 250 for those. Now of course here where the effects are in consecutive bins both in genes and in experiment numbers it's easy to just see these effects by eye but if you imagine randomly shuffling both of these axes you'd see that these effects would simply be lost in the noise. You can also see that corresponding to this square of constructed overdensity blue, there's a band of slight underdensity. And that's because, of course, we normalize each experiment, that is to say each column, to have zero mean and unit standard deviation. And similarly, the red square creates a blue band that extends up here. Completely irrelevant to this lecture, I want to point out that I see an interesting perceptual effect in this. I see not only the red band here, but I see sort of ghostly squares. Here I'll outline one, and I'll outline another, and I see a square up here. It kind of gets a little bit ghostly around here, but I kind of see a checkerboard pattern here, and it's not really there all that's there are the squares and the two vertical bands. I think what's going on here is one of these visual completion or visual phantom illusions. So uh, here are a couple, they're not quite the same thing but they have the same flavor. I think the illusion here is supposed to be that you see a kind of a darker blur in this band where it crosses the ridges of the background and in fact this band is exactly uniformly gray so that's one illusion and this one is kind of fun um, you're not supposed to be able to see what these random shapes are can you tell what they are? but if I simply put a black blotch on top of them allowing your eye to do the visual completion of lines then when it suddenly comes into focus for you, you'll see that there are simply repetitions of the capital letter B that occur in several places here. Okay, that's not really what we're talking about, but I couldn't resist. So we do the SVD thing on that toy data. Um, we take the data, find U, S, and V, um, and we're going to plot the magnitudes of the principal vectors, principal values, I should say, squared on a log linear plot. And sure enough, the um, top two uh, singular values are much bigger than all the rest, and all the rest are just slowly decaying. I've only shown you the first 50 here. Um, we saw before what Gaussian noise looks like if I continue it out all the way to 300. So we put in two main effects, and indeed we get out two large singular values that embody those main effects. The question is, how should we expect this to show up in the eigengenes and eigenarrays? Will it turn out nicely that this dot corresponds to one of the main effects and this dot corresponds to the other main effect? No, it can't be that because the eigengenes and eigenarrays are mathematically orthogonal. So here I've plotted for the toy example the first three eigengenes on the left and eigenarrays on the right. Um, let's start with the third one. The third one is just part of those random noise uh, principal components and therefore it's the green function which has no particular structure through it either along the 500 genes in the U matrix or along the 300 columns of the V matrix. The first two however, the blue and the red, definitely do show the 
uh, structure of the main effects we put in. But they orthogonalize it. They're both linear combinations. The red and the blue are each linear combinations of those two squares designed so as to remain orthogonal. In other words, here, this section, they both have a, about the same negative value. This section, they have a both about the same magnitude but opposite signs. And it's simply uh, designed so that all dot products that are supposed to come out zero come out zero. And similarly on the um, V matrix over here. So we do find that the first two eigenthingies contain an orthogonalized mixture of two main effects. Um, that's the good news. The third one is, as we expect, random. And in fact, if we had 20 main effects and they were approximatable by uh, linear directions through the origin, we would find them largely contained in the first 20 eigengenes or eigenarrays. Um, however, as mixtures, and that's the part that I'm always skeptical about. How do you sort out those mixtures once you've done the dimensional reduction? As a quick mention in passing, this is a problem that people have thought about before. And there exist methods of so-called non-negative matrix factorization, or NMF, whose purpose is exactly to stop main effects from mixing. And how can you do that? What can you impose? What other information do you have to try to disentangle the main effects? And the answer is sometimes you have positivity and that that can be used. So the canonical example is if you have a bunch of text documents with word counts so that you have a data matrix which has documents down the rows and words across the columns and every entry is the integer the number of times that word appears in that document. And what you'd like to do is you'd like to find a decomposition of this that says there are certain clusters of documents that are represented by the columns of F and they each cluster of document has a particular cluster of words associated with it and that the total data matrix X can be viewed or approximated as a sum so that a given document is a sum of a certain number of clusters with positive weights or you might say a given cluster can be viewed as a weighted average with positive weights of certain documents. Um, what this boils down to is looking for an approximation of X as a matrix product F times G transpose where these are both positive matrices in the sense that all of their components are positive. Now for our problem genes can be overexpressed or underexpressed so if we wanted to use uh, a variant of non-negative matrix factorization with positive matrices, we'd actually have to put in an additional diagonal matrix, maybe with just plus or minus ones along it. And so the positivity would be imposed on F and G, but not on the diagonal matrix. Well, this is a great plan when it works, but these methods have problems. They have their fans and they have their successes. But the problems are, one, the factorizations that you get are far from unique. Singular value decomposition has the wonderful advantage that it's a mathematically unique decomposition. There are in general not unique positive factorizations of matrices in this way. The second problem is that singular value decomposition has a very efficient linear algebra algorithm for computing it, whereas the computational algorithms for positive matrix factorization are often little more than brute force minimization of this difference. In other words, let all the values of F be uh, free but constrained to be positive, all the values of G be free and constrained to be positive, and in that huge dimensional space, move manipulate all of those values to try to minimize the deviation of FG transpose and X. 
Um, the problem is exacerbated by the fact that what you're interested in is a global minimum. How do you find that global minimum? Difficult computational problem. And then the third reason that I think non-negative matrix factorization algorithms are not universal is that they're clustering algorithms, but there are a lot of other good clustering algorithms around that are computationally efficient. In fact, we've already learned about Gaussian mixture models, about hierarchical clustering, and so forth. There's a place for non-negative matrix factorization, but that place is not to replace all the beautiful linear algebra when you can use singular value decomposition and principal component analysis.